Hello, hi. Uh, I'm Summer Islam. I'm one of the founding directors of Material Cultures, which I run alongside my partners, Paloma Gormley and George Masood. Um, we're a not-for-profit research and design organization, and we work at the intersection of natural materials and low body carbon construction and construction technology. We advocate for material reform in construction through design and research and education, and we work to demonstrate the simplicity and adaptability and also the efficacy of working with low embodied carbon materials. We believe this transition is not only possible, but urgently necessary, and that with it comes the opportunity to rethink the material cultures that surround us. We design buildings working to integrate bio-based materials and minimally processed materials into efficient construction systems that are adapted for contemporary modes of fabrication. And we also carry out research into how these ideas could be applied at scale and critically how they relate to a broader move towards, on the one hand, a circular economy and on the other hand, more regenerative land management practice. We look at how to integrate regenerative bio-based materials into existing structures and also how to shift construction practices at every level um, from education and training through to insurance and maintenance. We work with Central St. Martins, the Architectural Association, and the London School of Architecture to explore these ideas more broadly and to expand access to post-carbon thinking within education. We work very laterally across many scales and disciplines, from developing materials to large-scale developments, like this housing project we've been working on in Lewis. Uh, we live now in the oil age of architecture, and the ability to access and rapidly deplete the world's stores of carbon created an extraordinary amount of energy, fueling violent systems of material extraction and forced labor. The sheer scale of human production means that the landscapes and populations and economies of culture, sorry, of entire continents are being reconfigured by the infrastructures of material extraction. Contemporary materials and building systems reflect a masculinist culture of permanence and immortality with complete disregard for the consequences. Steel, iron, concrete and glass have built a dream of material cultures made autonomous of the systems that facilitate the ruination of our landscapes and the exploitation of people. These materials have no trace of their processing or making. They have surfaces which don't age but decay. And they form an architecture which is no longer an expression of place. Buildings that isolate us further from nature, the environment, and the ecosystems that sustain life. We've developed a construction culture with an incredibly high material turnover, in which care and repair have been replaced by demolition and renewal. And at the end of their short lives, our building materials become redundant and are left in a landfill to significantly outlive their time as a commodity. We've developed construction technology using materials whose availability is dependent on vast quantities of cheaply available oil. And they come together in contemporary buildings, which require specialist knowledge and equipment to maintain them, knowledge which is easily loft, lost, economically inaccessible, and depends on parts which readily go out of production. We can't continue to live under the same violent systems and forms of production that have led to our social and environmental crisis. And it's clear now that the industrialized ways of making buildings with concrete and steel and petrochemicals, which has dominated our construction industry in the 20th century, are changing the world in ways which are profoundly damaging. So we're entering an age now in which decarbonizing the built environment is increasingly accepted as critical and urgent. But what is less accepted are the means of achieving this and the consequences of doing so. Both require thorough interrogation if we are to avoid solving one set of problems only to find the solution to present new and unexpected challenges of their own. History contains countless examples of instances in which significant scientific and technological developments only later reveal unintended consequences. And in order to act meaningfully in effecting positive change within the construction industry, as professionals, we need to avoid the moralistic tone and binary discourse around the climate crisis where subjectivity and half-truths are common. 
Instead, moving forward into a post-carbon future, we must draw on the knowledge and experience accrued in other industries and disciplines to incrementally enable more resourceful and holistic decision-making that will produce the kind of built environment we want to live in. Decarbonizing the built environment demands new kinds of local infrastructures. We live within a globalized and interconnected world shaped by colonialist and capitalist ideas where materials and resources are drawn from places where poor labor and environmental practices render them ubiquitous and cheap. This system underpins what and how we build. A shift to bio-based and regenerative construction materials that are produced regionally and which make use of local conditions and cultural knowledge offers an alternative, a low impact approach to building with shorter supply chains and greater opportunities for equitable wealth building. But in order not to perpetuate the damage to our natural capital, which has already been wrought by construction, both on building sites and sites of extraction, the means of growing and producing these materials needs thorough investigation. Britain has a long history of trade and exploitation, extracting resources and materials from distant territories in a process of accrual. This reached its pinnacle at the height of empire, fostering in Britain a privileged perspective of its landscapes as natural and picturesque. Beneath this pastoral idyll is a territory subject to a multitude of pressures, many of which, like farming and forestry, are in direct conflict within, with one another. Failed economic initiatives and agricultural policies have fueled environmental degradation, contributed to growing levels of social inequity, and promoted competing attitudes to the land and its use. But whilst the climate crisis now makes headlines, a crisis in housing affordability persists. And developing the strategies and technologies to enable the supply and production of bio-based construction materials offers an opportunity now to reconcile the tensions between land use and land economy and the need for new housing. But it also requires reimagining how we use land at a local, regional and national scale. The future of a decarbonized built environment now depends on previously disconnected industries and seemingly conflicting agendas working together to facilitate systemic change. An extensive research of the consequences of different food farming and forestry management systems exists, but this research is siloed and typically explored from the perspective of either food production or manufacturing. The construction industry's reliance on petrochemicals and mineral extraction for the materials we use to build has meant its impact has been concentrated largely to mines and quarries and factory spaces that are out of sight and subsequently absent from our mental picture of what a landscape conjures. As we transition to the use of more regenerative and bio-based materials, the impact and scale of the built environment would be read again in the fields and forests, in productive woodlands and active mixed rotational farming systems brought into the public consciousness again after decades in which the impact of our urban fabric has been globally outsourced. Our research project, Constructive Land, explores both the opportunities that are emerging for an ecological approach to the production of materials and buildings, and the profound impact that these practices have on our ecosystems and societies, locally and globally. The work was conducted as recipients of the SOM European Research Prize in 2021 and alongside the Masters of Architecture students at Central St. Martins at the UAL in London, in collaboration with Forestry England and with the generous support of the Forestry Commission. The work investigates the complex interdependencies that exist in Britain, illustrating how the different industrial, social, cultural and economic pressures interrelate with the land and examining the potential new role of the architect in reconciling those demands. Whilst we have long understood land as a finite resource, we have often treated soil as an infinite one. Regenerative approaches to construction are based on a different understanding, one that understands that soil is something which is finite and vulnerable to degradation through misuse. Monoculture plantations like this can deplete our soils. They are nutrient hungry and clear felling disturbs the soils detrimentally. But this approach to the industrialization of our forests is driven by demand for high yields and fast growing softwood timber. Cultivated in Sitka spruce plantations like this one, grown and managed to feed the construction industry. 
These plantations are monoculture crops with limited biodiversity within their understories and no resilience in the face of climate change. If one tree goes down, so might the whole forest. And so our question is, what would our landscapes look like if we planned our forests and forestry practices around the needs of the soil rather than the demands of industry? To understand how our forests might change, we've been exploring what resources we already have in Britain. The UK uh, only has 13% of uh, land dedicated to forestry, which is less than half of the European and global averages of about 37 and 30% respectively. France, for example, has 32% forest cover. And the bulk of our forestry land in the UK sits within the uplands of Scotland and Wales, land which is essentially much less suited to arable farming. And of that scarce and very precious woodland, only 27% of it is in public ownership. And only 17% of that is certified as being in good ecological condition. So whilst we look to grow more trees, we also need to incentivize the better management of the forests we already have. With such limited resources, it stands to reason that we must import vast quantities of our timber in the UK. But 81% of our con annual consumption is imported. But this material is traveling vast distances, and often the sustainability of the practices used to manage and fell this timber is very opaque. So with the critical role that timber is set to play in decarbonizing the global economy and achieving net zero, the question of how these demands are met is ever pressing. The hatched area on the left of this diagram here shows how much land our annual consumption of timber is in the UK if it was planted as a Sitka spruce monoculture plantation forest. On the right hand side, we show how many trees would need to be planted to reach the 35 year maturity, or essentially what is shown there is a single crop rotation, a 35 year cycle of annual consumption of timber. In reality though, we consume a mix of tree species, both broadleaf and conifer, hardwood and softwood. Within both of these groupings, there are a whole host of different types of tree, within different roles in a forest ecosystem and different applications in use. These are timbers that, as architects and specifiers, we need to have a better understanding of if we want to meaningfully engage with our own resources. Coming back to this question of energy use and decarbonization, most of our hardwood in the UK is burned as wood fuel. It's predominantly our softwoods which we use in construction, and softwoods like the very much maligned Sitka spruce or the increasingly climate compromised larch. And it's buildings like this now which we need to question. We have such scarce timber resources. The ecosystems our forests support are so valuable. And every time we fell a forest to make a product or a building, we need to be using those resources as efficiently as possible, using that timber to make lean and lightweight buildings. We have speculated on a future land use model that is no longer confined to a risk averse market determined by the fossil fuel economy. A mosaic alternative to landscape management in which arable land is woven alongside short rotation forestry and coppice and shelter belts of broad-leaved tree species. We've explored the understories of these different systems to see what they support, what carbon they sequester, and what materials can be drawn from them. Here we show a drawing of a mixed native British woodland capturing oak and western hemlock and beech and birch and squirrels. Here we have a short rotation forestry system of eucalyptus and young pine, both species which serve currently the biomass industry. And in this system, we have trees for construction grown alongside arable crops like straw and hemp, a vision for a different and more diverse means of generating building materials within a landscape agroforestry system. So with this vision in mind, our project challenges the standardization driven forms of construction timber. And our collaborators on the MARC program at CSM have explored coppice wood, roundwood, and ungraded timber species. Through the production of prototypical and experimental structures which draw from materials that grow in our woodlands today, speculating on materials which could be cultivated in our landscapes in the decades to come. In this example, a structure of sycamore works to compress straw bales clad in sycamore shingles. By questioning the nature of a productive woodland, we're investigating the different benefits and outcomes of woodland management, from climate resilience to increased biodiversity and carbon sequestration. 
Productive woodlands have the potential to source innovative and new low embodied carbon materials, which could transform the built environment and also build regional supply chains across the country. In this image here by Connie Beecham, she's explored, for example, what forestry products you might extract from a 120 year cycle of a mixed forest of oak and sycamore and hazel and spruce and Douglas fir. So work like this, I think, demands that you think about your material cycles, not in terms of years, but maybe decades and sometimes centuries. The recalibration of our landscapes away from extractive practices towards a new model of regenerative land management is critical to address society and the environment's most urgent issues as a problem with common root causes. By fostering regenerative resources, providing opportunities for construction innovation and reconciling the tensions between land use and land economy and housing, we believe that we can improve the resilience and diversity of our ecosystems, but also promote the kinds of architecture and urbanism that can address the issues of quality and affordability and environmental impact in the built environment. We've looked at the regulatory and industrial and cultural limitations of change within the built environment, forestry and farming today. And our approach has sought to connect these disparate industries through dialogue and through the act of building itself. We've been using the construction process as a pedagogic tool, exploring how to work with smaller section and locally grown species of timber. This summer we designed and assembled a prefabricated pre structure, which is an outdoor forest classroom made from disease-stricken timber species, uh, particularly ash and larch, both of which are suffering within the UK now. And they're shown here in orange and green. And we've been exploring how you make not just structural systems, but single components out of different species, taking advantage of their different uh, structural properties, tensile strengths, and durability. So along the length of this single beam, which forms the A-frame, we transition from larch, which is very durable and exposed externally, to ash, which is ungraded. But actually, as it turned out, the particular sections of ash we were sent were um, very beautiful and very strong. And we've been doing this work in collaboration with 30 master's students from Central St. Martins. And we built this building over a seven week period. Um, the students worked in teams to prefabricate the structure in the workshops in King's Cross. And they learned to project manage and work with timber and to adapt to the inevitable and very unpredictable nature of live build projects. The structure will be assembled on site. It's been taken by lorry and trailer to our clients and hosts in Dolby Forest in Yorkshire one of the Forestry England public woodlands in the northeast. And we'll be erecting it on this site, this clear fell strip, uh, hopefully this coming spring, uh, in amongst the edges of a large plantation forest. The research will have impact at multiple scales, at the scale of the material, through the generation of new materials in conjunction with established industries. And the scale of the building through incorporating these materials into systems and components which could be applied at scale like this system made of eucalyptus, um, which is an interesting timber to use because it's often an invasive species, um, just used as firewood. And at the scale of the landscape through the promotion of new economic opportunities for land and agriculture that incentivize more ecological approaches to soil and biodiversity management. By actively participating in and provoking dialogue between policymakers and developers, designers and ecologists, foresters, farmers and the public we look to address the most pressing questions around the contemporary built environment today. The tension between our landscapes and sites on which we build, and the conditions in the fields and forests and quarries that we draw materials and products from to do so. This reconciliation is critical if we are to deal with the challenges of contemporary society that intersect with the issues of the built environment. And we hope this work can demonstrate the role that architects could play in this and how our critical and technical faculties uniquely equip us to take up a position as an interlocutor and agent and knit together complex stakeholder relationships into a network of collaborators capable of acting together to achieve change at scale. Thank you very much. <laughs>